And so people say, oh, well, that's a 21st century document because they're talking about it in that way. And then we can see this is a 5th century or 3rd century BC document because they're talking about it in this way. So you can't expect them to uh, be on the same wavelength that you may have been uh, used to, trained in, for whatever. So don't, I don't want to get into uh, whether this is chauvinist or not. And when women are not pure, there is disorder in the caste and social confusion. Now that is a, a good point. He's, what he's talking about, again, it's women's sexual behavior. And what he's talking about, since then, not a lot of, uh, you know, birth control uh, pills and things hanging around that time. And uh, usually sexual activity often, not usually, but often sexual activity gave rise to uh, pregnancies. And men haven't been getting pregnant very often over the course of time. So men's behavior had really not the same effects that women's behavior did. Because in any case, before DNA, you couldn't tell who the father of a given uh, offspring was anyway. And now, of course, uh, things are a little more clear. But uh, uh, so no one had any certainly apparent except for the woman's confidence. And since people didn't like supporting other people's uh, offspring, it's just a um, Part of human nature may be good, it may be bad. You say, well, it's offspring, what are you worried about? You know, well, people have a certain pride in their own genealogy. And, uh, you know, they want to know it's theirs. And so on, it's just part of human psyche. There's nothing you can do with it. It's in every society just about. There may be some exceptions, but I don't think there are many. So in any case, when the women are uh, not dependable, put it that way, confusion develops. I think that's a fair statement in those days. And maybe today, well, I'm not dependable, but I got a birth control bill, so what does it matter? You know, yeah, things have changed a bit. I'm not sure it's for the better, but uh, they have changed. And uh, these things are not the same. So you can't, again, put our situation onto those people, but that's how they would see it. And they make it clear here. Social confusion disorder of the castes. Look, could be an untouchable who had uh, relations with your wife. Now, you and I don't like the idea that they even were untouchables. But there's still untouchables in, in India. I mean, there's still untouchables. They're still trying to help the you know, young women and others who are born into that caste who tend to get it swept up into prostitution and other things like that. I just saw a thing about the flesh trade from Nepal to India. I mean, it's so horrendous that you, you wouldn't even want to look at the filming of what they showed. I mean, they just take young girls and they literally you know, friends kidnap them, whoever, and, and then they're gone. They're, they're prisoners in these brothels. And, uh, you know, all of them end up with AIDS. There's no way to go back. Uh, you know, it's just horrendous. And then they're servicing maybe like uh, five or ten men a day without stop. I mean, you know, it's just something to imagine is beyond the, what, for, for uh, 50 cents or something. I mean, it's, uh, be, it would boggle your mind to know what goes on in certain areas of the world. And, uh, so again, the critic of America here, uh, you may feel, you know, you've got to, uh, it has to be comparison and shopping. You know, you're, you're free to voice your to disapproval and your uh, anger at certain things, and no one's going to cut your head off and things like that. And generally speaking, here it could happen, but not. Oh, but if you see the conditions in some places, you bite your tongue before you start to. Uh, I don't hate to say spoil your own nest. You can work to improve this place, but it seems to me that uh, the criticism this place takes is way overblown. The good things are forgotten, and all the obvious flaws are emphasized. So that's not to say you should overlook them. But uh, you look at a situation like I just described, it's just mind-blowing. That's still going on. That's India, a country that's supposed to be rising up in the world. I'm sure it's not much different in China. I'm sure it's not much different, of course, whole swaths of Africa. And I wouldn't even want to imagine other places. So maybe that may not be the problem in these other places, but there are other problems. The, the, the 
things are in a very difficult situation over much of the human social situation. And uh, this book is saying, you see, when the sexual issue is not arranged in a proper manner, and the rituals and the taboos collapse, you get chaos. Well, I'm not sure you really do, but that's their view. Does this book support the caste system? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. It takes the world as it has it, and it's not into change. It's not trying to overthrow the present order at all. This is not a revolutionary, a social revolutionary book. It may be uh, looking for what's called enlightenment, but the enlightenment it seeks is more, I think, to lessen the burden of the world. It assumes the world is burdensome. Uh, Buddhism particularly assumes the world is burdensome, and it feels that uh, mainly not struggling against evil is, uh, is the easier path to take and to basically, uh, you know, get out of the evil cycle. But it's not, you know, it's not into struggle, social struggle. Now, uh, I personally, I, I don't like social struggle, but I personally do think righteousness is the important thing to look for in, in the best we can hope for in the world. And that struggle more came out of the damn Christian background than many others, particularly the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the prophets there are interested in justice and righteousness. And those, they're about, they're one of the few ancient documents that, that are interested in that, uh, in that issue. Uh, like Amos says, you know, what are they, the rich are cheating the poor, they're, cha they're, they're, they're changing the weights and measures in the markets and things, and I don't want your sacrifices, I don't want your, uh, you know, all your pious uh, rituals, give me justice and righteousness. So that's already being said in the 7th century BC, and that's why the Hebrew uh, Bible is so uh, sought after by so many cultures. A lot of people don't understand why they think it's just uh, accidental, it isn't accidental. Because of the emphasis on equality and righteousness in the prophets more than anything else. You don't get that in most religious documents. And then, of course, the Christian uh, documents spring off from those documents. And Islamic documents also come off from those documents. So, um, when you um, are looking for Eastern religions for salvation, don't forget, most of them are into quietism. Most of them are not interested in changing the social order. Not that you necessarily should change the social order. But one of the reasons social revolution and things like that come out more of the Judeo-Christian framework is because of the pro prophetical writings in the Hebrew Bible. That's what gives rise to these moral crusaders. I don't mean sexual moral crusaders. Moral cru crusaders in the sense of social justice. All right, uh, just a, a, an aside here. So anyway, this disorder carries into the family, destroys the family. The spirits of the dead then suffer because they are deprived of their ritual uh, offerings. And um, all righteousness and ancestral rights are destroyed. It says hell is waiting. Well, there's no idea, I don't think, in Hindu thought of hell. So it has to be some other idea that he's trying to uh, subsume under the word hell. This is the weakness of our Christian translator. He's using Christian terms to try to you know, express Hindu, Sanskrit, religious ideas. And uh, you say, well, what is the idea? I don't know. I'm not a Sanskrit expert. I can't be an expert on everything. All I can tell you is mean, it's not hell. It'd be, you'd have to think of it as maybe a being in a, not a good reincarnated state. A low order of reincarnation. Maybe you'd be in a bug state or something. Uh, maybe you wouldn't be on the rabbit level or something like that. So, uh, again, uh, so these things are laid out, and um, why should I kill my own people, 45? Uh, I am unarmed, unresisting. Um, 
basically, I just assumed he killed as, as fight, Arjuna says. So he's in despair and grief. So now Krishna, the teacher, has to get him out of this. So Krishna is the charioteer, but he's also the guru. He's also a man. He was a, 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 an actual uh, royal personage in a kingdom at some point. And as I said, he's always, uh, here's on this cover, he's always represented as a blue man. He's got lots of love and things, girlfriends and things like that. And there's artistic representations of him. He's always sitting with a beautiful damsel. And I don't think they're just playing games. They're not just uh, having tea. They're, they're, they are, he's quite a, I don't say he's a lecher, but uh, you know, he likes the ladies and uh, so on. And um, uh, so he's a flesh and blood person, but he's also a god. So, okay, in that regard, I think, as I said earlier, he re he, he's similar to Jesus in the scripture. It was a later presentation, the, the, the Gospel New Testament presentation of Jesus, first or second century AD, maybe. And, and as I said, I'm not sure they're totally different um, origins, the name and everything else, the way you have a man God presented. And the only thing in Jesus, except for Mary Magdalene uh, mythologies that you keep hearing about these days on the television because of the success of the Da Vinci Code and other type books and the feminism people think it's a marketable quantity so if they think it's marketable they'll flog it so aside from his supposed affairs with Mary Magdalene Jesus is not interested in the ladies so Jesus is not like Krishna in that regard okay? but in other regards there's probably a lot of similarity so Jesus is sexually continent person, we assume, from the picture of him that is provided. Okay? Is there anything that you I guess he's just a dark person, but I have no idea why they uh, want him to be blue. And I wouldn't be an expert on it anyway. I have to admit I'm not an expert on it anyway, but I bumble through the, the, the just to try to uh, help you uh, uh, penetrate these books. As, uh, best as you can. And um, you have to understand, professors, though they may act like they know everything, uh, only know certain things well. And uh, some things you can know as well as they can know. If you're studying it carefully, you're writing a paper on a given subject that they haven't uh, you know, uh, looked at carefully, you'll know more than they do about that given subject. And uh, Hinduism is something you can know as much about me if you do a, a little more reading than I've done. So uh, uh, you can probably find out why he's blue if you got on the internet and, you know, banged up Krishna, which I'm not going to do, and then bang up the word blue or something, and maybe there'd be an explanation somewhere running around in the uh, contemporary internet, I don't know. That's easier than going to the library these days. Uh, Krishna, chapter 2. Why this dejection, Arjuna? Strong men do not know despair. This neither wins heaven or earth. That he didn't. I don't think they believe in a heaven and an earth as such. I guess he meant uh, it doesn't win spiritual well-being, that's what we in the West would represent by heaven, and it doesn't win earthly, uh, earthly uh, prestige or happiness or, uh, or good, good vibes. So you just have to understand, when you see these terms, heaven and hell, uh, sin, that would not be in the original Sanskrit. That'd be some other word. This person is doing as best he can. Throw off discouragement. We get the idea. Uh, Arjuna then responds. We don't know if it's better to have victory, line six, or not. Look at this, line seven. In the dark night of my soul, I feel dejection. Well, <laughs> this is a Spanish Catholic translator here. The Dark Night of the Soul is actually the, the name of a famous Spanish Christian mystic poem. So, you know, <laughs> he's putting Spanish Christian mystic poems into his Hindu translation. I doubt if he said the dark night of my soul here. Maybe he said in, my, in the suffering of my soul or in my soul's dejection. But he puts here, you know, literary Spanish. I don't mean to make a thing of it, but this translation is terrible. 
Uh, he said, well, why do you use it? Not because it's readily available, and I don't know if it's so cheap, but it's one of the ones that's one easiest to get your hands on. So uh, there's no point struggling too much to find a better one. Maybe one day I will. In my self-pity, I see not the way of righteousness. I am your disciple. Be a light unto me, so I can find my path of duty. Neither he heavenly things or earthly things give me peace from the sorrow that burns in my life. And Arjuna then, he's a great warrior, told Krishna, I will not fight like Achilles tells King Agamemnon. And then, so we get the point here. So I don't think we can keep on harm. Let's see if we can give them here. He keeps on trying to uh, encourage him. Uh, let's see. Arise above them, strong soul. Um, the unreal never is, the real never is not. Interwoven is creation, the spirit is beyond destruction. Now, 17, the spirit, I don't know what he's talking about. What spirit? Is he talking about Atman or is he talking about Brahman? Certainly not hold the Holy Spirit of Christianity. So, and remember we said Brahman was external sort of um, power godliness and Atman was some internal. I would think it's something like Atman here but I, I can't be sure of that. It, but it's, a, it's an everlasting spirit, you see. So what Hinduism wants to do is get in touch with this everlasting spirit within yourself that they call Atma. Therefore, great warrior, carry on your fight. So right away, what's Krishna's recommendation? Fight. Now, is it a physical fight or a spiritual fight? In this book, it's basically both. I mean, they're not saying don't be a warrior. They're not saying go kill people. Because the very next sentence tells you that they don't consider it that way. And look at this dumb explanation here. And uh, again, I have some classes where I've told about my mother. She's one of my favorite characters. Bless her soul, she's still alive. She's 98, walking around the streets of New York. God knows how she manages. But uh, I like to appear because she's doing pretty well until now. I don't see any point in sticking her in an old warehouse of uh, folks home because I don't think she'd do very well there. But uh, I just got a thing from the complex she lives in. Uh, your mother's down here getting her mail in the bathrobe, uh, in her bathrobe uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening. You know, well, what, what, so what's the problem? She goes out of the lobby at 7 o'clock in the evening and she's 98 eight years old. You know, I wish your mother could walk around at 98 years old. You know, these people are amazing. You know. You know, she's upsetting the neighbors. I think she's demented. Well, she's smart enough to, to carry on at the present age. So, let's say most people out in the world don't really like people to be that old and to be carrying on, but she's doing okay. So, I don't really mind. But to go back to her behavior, she, my mother was the kind of person who believed everything she read. If, she, if it was written, she believed it. So, I told this thing in my other class last night, so I'll tell it to you. When I was your age, I, you know, back in the, I told you how bad this country was back in the 60s and 50s. Uh, I uh, um, came home one day, I just came out of college or graduating college or finishing college, and I said to her, I said, hey, mom, you know, America's a violent place, really violent place. It was more violent than that, was but uh, a really violent place. And uh, she said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean, son? I said, it's violent out there on the street. America's the greatest country in the world. And, you know, what are you saying? I said, well, get out there. No, this is the greatest country in the world. I said, okay, okay, fine. So five years later, I come back at some point, and she's reading the New York Times, which, of course, that's God's, God's speech to the New York Times. <laughs> so uh, she said to me, so I was just reading the paper here, and it says America is a violent place. <laughs> you were right all along. <laughs> So, uh, again, the moral is, uh, if she read it in the paper, it, it was true, but if you told it to her, it wasn't true. Why am I telling you that story? Because if you get a written document like this, if someone tells you this is nonsense, you're not going to pay any, any attention necessarily to that person. Uh, they see it written somewhere, oh, oh okay, fine. But, 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 but writing is a very, very powerful thing. So, but I believe if you can go along and say, well, this is ridiculous, you should say it. So look, if a man thinks he slays and another thinks he is slain, neither knows the way of truth. So you're killing in wars, you're not really killing anyone here. I mean, I think that's just poppycock. 
<laughs> but anyway, you know, that's the argument being put forth by whoever this guru is. And it's not Krishna, you can be sure. Uh, it's some guy writing in the name of, uh, of course, a woman, writing in the name of Krishna. The eternal in man cannot kill, the eternal in man cannot die. Well, okay, that's very comforting, but I'm not sure how many of you believe it. And uh, I think uh, that's not a reason to tell a guy to go fight. You're not really killing anyone, it's okay. You know, so stop this worrying about killing, you're not killing anyone. This is, to me, it's, uh, it's just mind-bogglingly stupid. But anyway, the point is what they're getting at, these things are all spiritual. So we got rid of that one right off. You know, let's, let's not worry about all these cousin aunts and uncles. You're not really doing anything with that. Let's get to the serious stuff, the spiritual stuff. Uh, he is never born. He never dies. He's in eternity. He is forever. He is never born and eternal beyond time to come, gone and come. He does not die when the body dies. So there's some eternal thing in human beings. I guess hopefully it's an ant and flies and hummingbirds as well, that is immortal, eternal, and your point is to get into that <coughs> somehow. That's the, that is the, the, the goal of all enlightenment process minded people, whether they're Buddhists, uh, Hindus, uh, Western mystics, Islamic Sufis, Kabbalah seekers, anyone, and we call this mysticism. This is what the people are with. People think mysticism has something to do with uh, mysteriousness. Nothing to do with mysteriousness. Mysticism and, mysteri and mystery are, are not the same thing. They are totally different things. Mysticism is the word we use for to describe people who are trying to seek spiritual enlightenment and think there is such a thing as spiritual enlightenment and think that by seeking spiritual enlightenment, they somehow get into an eternal state of being. I think that's a pretty good definition. I couldn't do a better one. Probably didn't find a better one in Webster's Dictionary either. But uh, that was on the that was right on that was on the spur of the moment on the run, if you like. So that's what they do. A man leaves his old garment and puts on one that is new. The spirit leaves the mortal body and puts on a new being. You know something? If you've ever read the Christian New Testament and got as far as Paul in 1 Corinthians, how many have read 1 Corinthians in this room? And at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about changing your body, that you don't die, that you go into a different state of being. That's exactly what he's talking about here. There is only hardly a stitch of difference because Paul is a mystic, uh, he really is, and that's where he shows that he's uh, involved in these mystic, um, these mystic religious uh, ways of thinking about things. But I think it's 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to 42, yeah. probably. So you could probably. That's quote the one that like a bunch of different religions like all debate over, like whether or not like they go up to heaven or like whether there's. Yeah, like, you will be changed. Basically, you'll put on a different clothing, and um, you know I'm going to tell you a heavenly mystery. He says a heavenly secret. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, it's almost even so you know your Bible, and this is almost exactly the same. So this gentleman here, there's another example of someone who would know something as well as a teacher. There are some people who have certain areas of uh, knowledge that they take out pretty well, and they'll know more than uh, give a lecture on a given subject. So um, don't ever be uh, over impressed by it. the person standing before you. There's probably someone in the room who knows more about a given thing. In any case, um, this idea of putting on a different uh, body and becoming eternal and leaving the old one being behind and so on is widespread across all of Europe and into Asia at this time. Very widespread. In the, in the West it was called Neoplatonism. And it was very strong in Alexandria in Egypt. Neoplatonism means the new Platonism. And there are a lot of religious groups that plugged into this, this ideology. By the way, Paul, as you may know, is not just a, a mystic. He claims to be having mystic visions, as he calls them in his writings, apocalypsios. In Greek, the word for vision is apocalypsis, apocalypsis. And he says, if you look at Greek, he says, and I had this apocalypsios. I had this vision of the Christ in heaven and so on. 
So he's uh, he's constantly having visions. People, by the way, have visions of worrying. But uh, to me, they're usually looking at the, the vision is usually themselves that they're seeing in some uh, supernatural state. Uh, but anyway, this is a very widespread putting on a new garment, leaving the body. So these people are not interested in social injustice. They want to get out of suffering, their own suffering. They're very egocentric in their approach to salvation or a spiritual well-being. They're not interested in social well-being particularly, though they want the society to be orderly here. But that's the most he wants. They're not interested if someone's suffering, but as far as he's concerned, there is no suffering. You can get out of suffering by if you follow this book. So suffering is something you can deal with follow what I'm saying. There is no killing. I mean, if you're a warrior, you're not killing anyone. If they're suffering, you're not suffering if you know how to get out of it. So this is what the Enlightenment is aimed at, and it's very much, I, I personally don't like these religions much, but that's only because I'm born in the West. I think they're harmless. I don't think they're really hurting anybody. And they teach people how to bear misery, so I think that's a good thing. Um, but to my mind, they don't really um, work me up into a state of a spiritual excitement, but they don't want to. They want to calm you down. So, uh, I think uh, there are good things to them. You won't get high blood pressure in this, uh, in this religion. It'll, uh, it'll slow you down, it'll calm you down, and you'll start to you know, do the meditation process and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. Body, it is raised in power. It is so in a natural body, it is raised in spiritual body. Now, I'm talking about when he puts on a new form of, uh, of body there. Anyway, it's a long passage, so I appreciate that, but um, these people will find it. Uh, it's, I'd have to look and see the actual passages that are the parallel there. I don't have it in front of me here. Oh, well, since you're starting, i got a Bible somewhere in here. Let me see. What, what's the number is it? What number is it? I don't like this one. <laughs> this is a bad trans This translation stinks too. But, uh, it's cheap and you can mark it up. Okay, okay. Here it is. So, if some people ask when you're raised, what sort of body do they have when they come back? That's a stupid question. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Everything that is flesh is not the same flesh. There's human flesh. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it's the same with the resurrection of the dead. The thing that is sown is perishable, the raised is imperishable. Uh, the raising is glorious. Here it is. The soul had its own embodiment, so does the spirit. The first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam became the life-giving spirit, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, anyway, as earthly man, so are we on earth. As heavenly man, so are we in heaven. And we have been modeled on the earth, we've been modeled on the heavenly man. Or else, brothers, put away flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom. Uh, I will tell you a heavenly secret, that we're not all going to die, but we shall all be changed. That's the passage of it. This occurs in the instantaneous twinkling of an eye when the last trumpet, the raising of the dead, it was always pictured as the last trumpet, sounds, the dead will be raised imperishable. We shall be changed, because our present perishable nature must put on imperishability. There it is. Put on a new body, put on a new form will put on imperishability, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. So that's basically what I was uh, uh, getting to. He, he takes a more, uh, more poetic way of saying it, but basically it's the same. You're going to put on a new, uh, uh, a new uh, imperishable cloak. Well, I'm glad you guys think so, and uh, I hope it comforts you. But I wouldn't want to, uh, wouldn't want to bet my. Uh, I wouldn't want to bet in Las Vegas on that number coming up uh, very often, but if you think it's going to happen, I'm, uh, it'll, it'll make you feel better, and I'm happy for you. I hope you're right. But, uh, I've seen dead things, and they don't look to me like they're going anywhere. I don't think human beings are superior to ants. I just killed them in a, a fly in my bathroom, and I felt real bad the other day because I had blood going on my mirror, and I really felt guilty I did. Oh, for this little creature, but it was annoying me. <laughs> I just felt that his annoyance of me was worth more than 
then uh, getting rid of that annoyance, then the pain I felt in seeing him dead, which did give me pain. So uh, I don't have the answer to these. In any event, um, I put Paul's testimony there on the same level as this. You can accept it if you want, and uh, if you don't want, that's up to you. But let's go back to this one, because I think they're basically uh, uh, founded in the same way of thinking. So let's go back to this one. Beyond the power of sword and fire, beyond the power of waters, winds, the spirit is everlasting, omnipresent, never changing, never moving, ever one. That, I think, is probably Brahman. Beyond all powers. Uh, everything must die, okay. So, right off the bat, I think from the first uh, chapter, what are we interested in? Just like Paul is interested in, by the way. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, Paul said, I am no Christian. That makes me not Christian because I don't believe anyone rises from the dead, but that's a personal side on that. Um, uh, you know, if you believe it, then you may be a Christian. And Paul puts it right. So the, the aim of what he's, uh, what he's aiming at is the conquest of death. And I think around the Mediterranean, that's what all the mystery religions were aiming at, that people were frightened of death. People today are frightened of death. Everyone's frightened of death. Uh, nobody likes the idea of it, I can assure you. And uh, most people just block it out because it's too awful to contemplate. And other people try to solve it. So when you try to solve it, these are some of the solutions you come up with, like Paul's letters or the Bhagavad Gita. But notice, the whole thrust of the Bhagavad Gita so far has been conquering death. Conquering death and suffering. That, that, that's what its, that's what it's, it's, it, it's aim is for, to obtain imperishability, immortality. Now that is appealing. You know whether it's a realistic, uh, whether it's a realistic uh, endeavor and goal is something else. Doesn't matter if you think it is, then it's fine. So um, he is assuming all these things on these kind of statements. The spirit in all things is immortal. Uh, let's see. I, I went ahead of myself here. Uh, it's everlasting. Uh, out of death comes life, page line 27. Invisible before birth of all beings, after death they are invisible again. They're, they are seen between two unseen. Okay, that's really clever. I, I agree with that. Everything before me I don't know about. Everything after me I don't know about. I'm only between two unseen. Fair enough. Uh, the spirit is, oh, but anyone can figure that one out. The spirit is, all beings is immortal in the wall 30. For death of what we cannot of what cannot die cease to sorrow. Here it is, the same thing again. Same reason why the, the warrior doesn't kill uh, bodies. Uh, since everything is imperishable, you don't have to just feel sorrow anymore. It's not going to cease, so you can stop all this uh, silly, uh, you know, maudlin self pity and uh, and sorrow that you're going through here. Okay, that's a good argument, but I'm not sure we're convinced, right? What is the assumption, and I haven't gotten but as long as I'm talking about evaluating these things, what's the assumption built into all these things? I hinted at it last time. It's the fact that the body and the soul are different. That there is, they all assume that there's a body and a soul. Christianity assumes that. I'll leave Judaism out here because I don't know what Judaism thinks on these things. It's not clear. It doesn't have a, you know, a doctrine that's... Um, uh, consistently abstracted, so it's more like a culture and a history of a people. It's not a, it's not a theological doctrine as such. So it's hard to say what their stance would be. But Christianity is a theological doctrine as such, mostly written in Paul's letters. And uh, you can extract what the doctrine is. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita has a doctrine, though I think Hinduism is much broader than the Bhagavad Gita. Hinduism is many, many things. It's the, Hinduism is the culture of the people, somewhat like Judaism. But this aspect of Hinduism, this mystic aspect of Hinduism here, we can see what the doctrine is. And it's based on the soul-body split. That the body is the perishable, perishable part of things, because we know it rots away in the earth and it worms eat it, and pretty soon it's all gone except the bones, and then you can grind them up too if you're interested. Uh, so the body is perishable, any fool can see that, but the spirit is imperishable. That's just an assumption. That's an assumption, and of course anyone who takes logic, philosophical ideas here knows 
that if your conclusion is already assumed in your assumption, you, you're on your way to a syllogism. A implies B, uh, B implies C, so A implies C. If what you've assumed A already has implies what you're going to prove C, then in fact uh, you're, you're all set. So half the time it's your assumptions that have to be worried about, not your conclusions. And here the assumption is they don't prove there's a body-soul split, they just assume it. And then they go from there, well, if you're going to assume that, then anything you want to say on the basis of that is going to work out. So you've already assumed that the soul is immortal. That there is such a thing as a soul distinct from the body. Uh, well, 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 then you're going to always get to this world. Well, let's get rid of the body. And that was the whole point of all these mysticism. Ultimately, all the mysticism ended up with the same idea. The body is corruptible. The body is evil. The body, the flesh is evil. We hear it in Christianity. We hear it in Hinduism. We hear it in all religions of that kind. Uh, and a lot of people who don't think the body is evil and who are, let's say, Christian, like in the 60s and 70s, had a big problem with this because they were into body pleasure, sexual activity, uh, all kinds of things like that, and, and, and they didn't like hearing that these things were evil. And uh, so the church and these things uh, came into conflict quite a lot in our world, the Western world, particularly since the French Revolution or the Enlightenment period when people began to think, well, maybe those assumptions weren't totally correct. Well, we're going to read Walt Whitman which is why I'm reading him, and he's an American poet of the Civil War period, but he has a religious doctrine. And basically, he doesn't think the body and soul are, 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 are separable. He says, uh, whatever one I am, I am the other, and the two are inseparable. And uh, I think this is a, 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 a definite, clear statement of someone who doesn't think the body is evil, who doesn't think, therefore, what the body does is evil. And the whole reason he doesn't think that is he doesn't think the body and the soul are separate. And personally, I agree with him. And that's about to you right off the bat. I don't think you can separate these things out the way the ancients thought you could. And their arguments, to my mind, all fall on the idea that they've already assumed what they're going to prove. They've already assumed that the two are separate, and there's no proof that they are. In fact, I don't think that when you stamp out the body, that the spirit remains, unfortunately. I wish it were true. But again, don't listen to me. That's me. And you don't have to believe what I believe. You shouldn't you believe what you believe. I'm just giving you what I think the weakness is. I'm giving you the counter position of someone who's not convinced. And the reason I'm not convinced is I don't accept the original assumption. Yeah. But it seems to me that you can't prove it either way. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm saying I don't think they proved their case. That's all I'm not. They think that this is true. I'm not, I'm not telling you what I think is true. I don't know what is true. But I know that they haven't proved their case because they've assumed what they're going to prove this all. But on the other hand, you can't say that the people that believe that the body and the soul are one who how, how I haven't tried to prove that case. I just said that's what I think. That doesn't mean I, I'm, I'm not trying to convince you of that. What I'm trying to do is say that the other people haven't proved their case to me in terms of all these doctrines that spring from that. Because I, I can get to where they're going easy. Once I make the original assumption the body and soul are, are separate, then I go, oh, well, the body's no good. Okay, so the, body, so the things the body does are no good. Um, touching is not good. Uh, eating is not good, sex is not good, all these things, uh, gluttony, all the seven cardinal sins, all those things, they're all no good because they're part of the body activities, what Plato called the appetites. Plato was the originator of this kind of thinking in the Western world. Plato's not a philosopher, he's a religious thinker, and people don't sometimes realize that. And these words he puts in Socrates' mouth, though Socrates is a good lawyer, as I told you, and a good dialectician, he's not a good argument. I mean, he, he, he's, not, he, he's, not, he is not a philosopher, he's arguing for religious ideas. The religious idea he's arguing is that the soul is imperishable, and that the body is, um, is basically evil. That's what Plato and Socrates are arguing, that's what Christianity basically is presenting you, that's what Hinduism basically is presenting you, but it isn't you see, you're saying you haven't proven my case. No, I'm not trying. I'm not, I don't have a religion. I'm not marketing anything in a religious way. They've marketed this. 
worldwide throughout all history and made it look as if this is what you have to believe and it's absolutely so. All I'm saying is that it's all based on a misassumption. They've assumed uh, what they're trying to um, prove, that if you mortify the body, you're going to release the soul. Okay, I would agree that if you curb your bodily appetites, you might get some discipline in your life and you might live a little longer and you might be a healthier person, and that's a good thing. Moderation, not eating too much, not drinking too much, not copulating too much, uh, <laughs> not uh, talking too much like I do, uh, all kinds of, th this might be good, you know, uh, moderation and stuff like that. And it might, it's a healthy thing, but that doesn't mean you're going to be immortal. That's all. I mean, there it was, make the claim, not me. So, so um, you say, I haven't proved not. I don't say I have proved anything. I'm, I haven't been convinced by their claim because I don't think that their claim has any viability, logically speaking, because they've assumed what they've set out to prove. If they could prove this, if they could tell me that there is a body and soul that are different, if they could prove that, let's go. That there, if they could prove that there is an immortal soul, let's go. Let's move. And they all, to me, this is all attempting to comfort people, which is fair enough. We live a short time, we have a rotten time, a lot of us, many people get sick, they lose people that they love, they need comfort. They don't like to look at the, at the, at the bleak end of things. Look at the Egyptians. And by the way, I'm closer to the bleak end of things than you guys are. So, I, mean, I, should be the, I should be more worried about this than you guys are. You, know, you guys got a long time before you're getting close to the bleak end. Uh, I'm lesser than you, I got more gray hair than you. But uh, the point of the matter is, look at the ancient Egyptians. What was their whole interest? Saving their souls. Getting immortal. They were petrified of death. They built great pyramids. They did all this. They stored up all this stuff in these pyramids. They gave people all kinds of handbooks to get through the mess, the magic formulas after they died to go into where they needed to get to to survive. Uh, they laid it all out in you know, hieroglyphics, huge, huge uh, efforts to, uh, to preserve and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is nobody's been immune from this since people began thinking. And I'm not saying you shouldn't follow what you think, but I'm just saying don't think you've proved it. Your situation is based on assuming what you set out to prove. And if we don't accept your basic premise, none of it follows. And that's all Whitman is saying. He doesn't accept their basic premise. Now, you may not say, uh, you may not accept his. He doesn't accept that the soul and the body are different. And uh, most people didn't ever have the courage to say that, that's all. He's one of the first, and he's a great American poet, so I like to read him to show there's another side sometimes of a person who doesn't believe that that is true. Anyway, I don't want to argue with you. I'm just saying that you can think about that, but I think it's important I don't know if you, anyone ever told you in your life that there may not be a soul-body split. So if no one ever told you that, so that's a valuable lesson in, the, in a classroom to hear for a change. Because everyone always tells you the opposite. So it's not bad that someone comes along and says, hey, wait a minute now, examine your thinking because that's what we're supposed to do in the university. Even if you do believe this, if you're a religious person and you care and so on, and I admire religious people who care. Um, let's stop a moment. Are you sure that that's true? And can you prove it? And you have the basis something besides faith uh, on which to prove it? And therefore, it's a good thing in the university to, uh, to question. So I think it was, again, the ancient Greek philosophers, Aristotle, one of them, said the unexamined life is not worth living. I'm not sure that's true, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. So that's all we're trying to do here, and I'm trying to show you why I don't personally accept this book and all books related to it, because I think that they are based on a misassumption from the beginning. But having said that, I think these books are useful. So again, forget what I think. I'm just trying to be honest to you here. But if I see an argument, I'm not going to just propagandize it for you. So anyway, uh, this book not only talks about this uh, immortal spirit that cannot die, line 30. But the next one, it speaks about duty. There's no greater good for a warrior than to fight in a righteous war. 
okay, so good wars are righteous wars are okay too. That we, we got that one. And uh, in death thy glory in heaven, 37. In victory thy glory on earth. Prepare for war with peace in your soul. Be at peace in your soul. In this peace there is no sinning. Okay. We're basically at the end of the, uh, no, no, we've got more in this uh, lecture, but basically we're at the end of the argument here. Uh, and this, uh, do you think he's proved anything here? No, I don't think he's proved anything. It's just good pep talk. Uh, but uh, nothing has been proven here, really, I think, to anyone's satisfaction. Uh, maybe it has, maybe it has. But let's go on here, because I thought we were at the end, but we are not. Uh, let's see. Let, prepare for war with peace in your soul. Now that is another point I think is important to emphasize. There's body and soul split. There's duty. And this book thinks you should do your duty, even if you're an untouchable uh, street sweeper. If you sweep the streets well, you actually are doing uh, a good service, and in fact, you are uh, fulfilling your karma, if you like. Uh, so, um, the final conclusion here, in peace there is no sin, maybe, uh, I think maybe no adverse things, I would be maybe a better word there. In peace there are no adverse things. So, peacefulness is also something there, see. And I said, that's why the blood pressure will get lowered from these, uh, from these types of approaches to reality. Because they seek a, a lowering of the, uh, of the you know, struggle, uh, finding peace. Uh, and that's another outcome of these disciplines, which are, I think, positive for a person. But that, that you're going to achieve eternality is the only one that I'm arguing with. I'm not arguing with the others. That you think you're going to become an eternal being, I think, is uh, probably something that uh, is wishful thinking on your behalf. However, uh, you may, but uh, you have to prove that. This is the wisdom of the Sanhai. The vision of the eternal. Here now the vision of the wisdom of the yoga. The path of the eternal. And the freedom from bondage. So, uh, Sankaya is a person uh, looking for the eternal wisdom. Now we're going to get the path of the yogi. And the next several lines talk about the Vedas, line 45. And it says, Arjuna, be in truth eternal, beyond eternal opposite, earthly opposites, beyond gains, possessions. Possess thy own soul. That is, find your soul, work on your soul, and so on. And you're going to start the work of the yogi. Set your heart upon your work. This is now karma yogi work yoga. Set your heart upon your work. Don't look for the reward. Do not work for the promise of heaven and hell as it were. Do not work for a reward. Do your work in the peace of yoga, free from selfish desires. Now what is yoga? Yoga is the discipline that you follow to achieve these goals. And the yogi is the one who follows the discipline. Now this discipline, there are different kinds of yoga. This discipline, this karma yoga, is the discipline of work yoga. So you do your, that's the only other thing that we've been hearing about, but it's going to apply to our Juna situation. It's not going to be about heaven and hell necessarily, or spiritual immortality. It's going to be about whether you should fight the war again. And our, our Juna, we can see what's coming. Our Juna should do his duty. Our Juna is a warrior. He should war well. He should do his, whatever task he's been assigned, he should do that well. But not for a reward, not for glory or something like that. Work done for reward is lower than work done in the yoga of wisdom. Seek salvation the wisdom of reason. How poor those who work for a reward. In this wisdom, a man goes beyond what is well done, what is not well done. Go, therefore, uh, to wisdom. Yoga is wisdom in work. Okay, you will get wisdom. I guess the Sankhya is looking for wisdom. You will get wisdom, but only by not seeking it through as a reward for what you're looking for. And the discipline itself will provide the wisdom you're looking for. So uh, the, the work that you do is the discipline. Seers in union with wisdom forsake the rewards of their work and free from bonds of birth, they go to the boat of salvation. Well, this now is doctrine again. It's a bit difficult in English to follow. 
But I think here wisdom is Brahman. Seers in union with Brahman, I think that's probably what's being said there, free from the bonds of birth, go to the salvation. When the mind leaves behind its dark forest of delusion, thou shalt go beyond the scriptures of times past and uh, present. Now, if you know Plato again, if you study Plato, Plato has a famous image, the cave image. And he says humans are really uh, like people living in a dark cave. And uh, I always think of it like a dark movie theater. And they see shadows on the wall of the cave. They're chained inside there, and they see cha shadows on the wall of the cave. But that's their reality. That's the world that they're living in. They don't really understand what is going on except through these shadows, and they're stuck in this dark cave. I think of it in the modern world. People in a cinema, and they're watching all these uh, images on the screen, you know. And he says, the philosopher is the person who goes out and stands in the light of the sun. And that's the famous uh, Platonic cave allegory. So the philosopher is the one who is in the light of the sun and sees true wisdom and gets uh, philosophy in Greek means love, wisdom. Philo, sophos. Sophos is wisdom. Uh, philo is love. So you're loving wisdom. The philosopher is a lover of wisdom. So the lover of wisdom goes out and sees the sun where all the other people are chained in darkness. That's a little like what the Bhagavad Gita is saying. So this line 52 is just about the same as what Plato is talking about in more detail in his cave image. That um, when the mind leaves the dark forest of the loot, then you see what the people have been seeing uh, from outside of shadows being thrown on the wall from movement outside in the daylight the philosopher goes out and actually sees what these things are in themselves. So he's the only one who achieves this enlightenment, as it were. All the others are stuck in the cave. And that's the image of all these mystic uh, approaches to reality, uh, to the situation they're trying to describe. OK. Arjuna asks the usual Carlos Castaneda Dumbo question. <laughs> What are his words? What is sonnets? What is his work? You know, this is Carlos Castaneda talking to uh, um, uh, whatever the other guy's name was. Don Juan. Don Juan, right. Okay, Krishna goes on. When a man surrenders all his desires and comes to the heart, by grace of God finds the joy. So here goes the platonic defeating of appetites. Christian, Neoplatonic, Hindu. When you surrender your desires, so you see, if you don't have desires, Buddhism also says, you're not going to suffer. Because your suffering comes in desiring something and not getting it. So if you curb your desires, you, you ain't going to suffer anymore. And that gives rise to all this. So a lot of these things are directed at curbing your desire, your ambition, your you know things that you want to get a hold of or whatever, because it's the fact that you're denied them that makes you unhappy. Um, you know, it's a convenient way of approaching the world. It, it does work, it helps. He whose mind is untroubled by sorrow, and he has no longings, uh, fear, anger, he has an unwavering mind. Again, what they're looking for, along with all these other things, is evenness of mind. That you're not deflected to the right or the left. That things, your daily ups and downs, don't get a hold of you. I try to do that in my life. I don't know if you do too. If I get up and say, oh God, today was a bad day. Uh, my uh, son, my daughter, my wife, uh, my employment, my this, my publisher, they giving me a hard time, you know, today. Uh, what I'm trying to achieve to get through that day is what? I can't solve any of those problems. I know that. Evenness of mind. So that I can still keep my even state of being and get on with the day and get on with the next day. I think most people are trying to do that in one form or another. Therefore, yoga is an aid to do that. And these other disciplines out of Buddhism and other religions of that kind that teach you evenness of mind. And not to pay attention to various sufferings or desires or ambitions or, or things or passions. From passion comes confusion of mind. Uh, 61, bring them all in harmony. That's a big platonic idea. Let him sit in devotion and union, his soul finding rest in me. For when his senses are in harmony, then he is in serene wisdom. That's totally platonic. 
you read the Plato, Socrates, uh, they, 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 they're always talking about harmony of the soul and getting harmony of the soul. And the only difference is that he speaks about in me. See, Krishna is not just a teacher, he's the God himself, he is Brahman. Because he's achieved one with Brahman. And, and, and that's the other thing that I've missed here. Part of this whole process of enlightenment is to get out of your body and to achieve Brahman, that is, union with Brahman. Since Brahman is the total immortal principle, it's the immortal reality outside of all other realities, I call it God. And if you can achieve union with Brahman, then you can achieve, like the Neoplatonists would say, union with the One. All this is an enlightenment process. Uh, and therefore, when you're in union with Brahman, and that's why these yogis and everything, when you see them, and when they claim to have had enlightenment, are not here anymore, they're somewhere else. And the same in Islamic mysticism and others then you have, in fact, um, 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 gone out of this world and into the immortal eternal world. So you see, you find rest in me. From passion comes confusion and loss of remembrance, the forgetting of duty. So obviously these uh, passionate states, these worked up states, these states of desire, they're no good. There is no wisdom, line 66, is for a man without harmony. And without harmony there's no contemplation. In the dark night of all being, 69 awakes to light in the, the tranquil in man. 71, for the man who forsakes all desires, abandons all pride of possession, and uh, of self reaches the goal of peace supreme. So there you go, there's the goal. Abandon all desires, all possessions. So what's the goal? Evenness of temper and union with Brahman, the one eternal principle. The goal is conquering suffering and death. And the way to do it is through these exercises where you, it's not to get drunk all the time because you're going to wake up from those things or be on drugs because you're going to, you know, you know you're going to have a bad trip sooner or later, et cetera, et cetera. The way is through spiritual exercise of this kind. So all I was trying to say is I'm not sure that's going to produce the eternality that they're after. It may produce the discipline, and I, I, I give them that. This is the eternal in man. Reaching him in all delusion is gone. Even in the last hour of his life upon earth, man can reach, and here it is, the nirvana of Brahman. The nirvana is a word that is supposed to symbolize um, a paradise state, or a state of perfect being, perfect bliss. And it's not only a, an idea, as you see in Buddhism, you don't normally think of nirvana as a Buddhist idea, but Buddhist are looking for nirvana. It comes out of Hinduism right here, and it's already in the uh, Bhagavad Gita. That's something there, sir. So when you're in Brahman, if you've achieved this goal of getting out of the body, <coughs> have I explained it clearly to you, and getting in this other state of being, then in fact you're, you've got it. Let me do a little bit of chapter three before you run off, if I can. Give me five or uh, ten more minutes. Because uh, once we've done chapters two and three, we've basically done the whole book. I'll do some more after that. But these things happen, and these doctrines get repeated then. Look, let's get into them again quickly, because I know time is way. And uh, look, uh, Arjuna, is vision greater than action? Why do you want me to act in this terrible war? Uh, basically, 3-1, three, 3-2. Three, three, uh, tell me the truth. By what path should I attain this from and this supreme? OK, here he lays it out, Krishna. There are two roads to getting this perfection as I have already told. One is jnana yoga, the wisdom of the Sankhyas, that looks to the wisdom of enlightenment. Jnana yoga, I, I don't have to write on the board, it's there. The other is karma yoga, the, the yogi act. So there are Sankhyas who are looking for an, an enlightenment state, and he says the yogis are not so much looking for that, they're looking for the path of perfect action. So not by refraining from action does it demand in turn obtain freedom from action. Nor by renunciation does he attain supreme perfection. Now we're talking karma yoga here. Uh, so he who withdraws from actions, he is under a delusion. That's a false path. So this is a different uh, sermon here. The great is the man who, free from attachment and with a mind ruling its powers in harmony, works on the path of karma yoga, the path of consecrated action. So karma yoga means that you have 
Action is greater than inaction. Perform, therefore, your task in life. That's the next step. That is, do your duty, do your work. Even the life of the body could not be if there were no action. <coughs> so, <coughs> and let your actions be pure, free from desire, uh, the, the bounds of, uh, 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 you know, uh, ambition, and so on. And then he goes on uh, a bit there to praise the old religion, 10 to 15. I'll pick that up next time. We're going to move along here to this uh, karma yoga. Uh, again, in liberty from the bonds, 19 of attachment, do your work that is to be done. For the man whose work pure attains indeed the supreme. Um, King Janna and other warriors reach perfection, line 20. In the actions of the best man, Others find the rule of their action. Their path that a great man follows becomes a guide to the world. I have no work to do in all the worlds, Arjuna, for these are mine. I have nothing to obtain because I have everything. He's in Brahman. He's nothing he needs. I was not bound to action, never tiring, everlasting. If ever my work had an end, these worlds would end. In destruction, confusion would reign. And so on. Fine. Let not the wise disturb the mind of the unwise in their selfish work. 26. Let him work with devotion. Even as the unwise work selfishly in the bondage of selfish work, let the wise man work unselfishly for the good of the world. Line 30. Offer to me all your works. Rest your mind on the supreme, Brahman. Be free from vain hope and selfish small thoughts, and with inner peace fight your fight. 35. And do your duty, even if it is humble, rather than another's, even if it be great. To die in one's duty is life. To live in another is, is death. 41. Set therefore your senses in harmony. Slay sinful desire. Say that the power of the senses is great, for the greater than the senses is the mind. Greater than the mind is booty, which is where the Buddha comes from, a, a kind of overall arching wisdom. And greater than reason is he the spirit in man, Atman. Know him therefore who is above booty, reason, and let his peace give you peace. Be a warrior, kill desire, and the power of the other soul. All right, what is he saying there? I think he's basically saying work well, work evenly, do the work that's assigned to you. Work is necessary to keep the world going. Therefore, the society needs people who do their work, it needs teachers who work well, it needs garbage men who work well. It needs warriors who work well. It needs bureaucrats who work well. It needs politicians who, who, who work well. But the thing in working is you shouldn't be working for ambition. You shouldn't be working for uh, a goal that will enrich yourself. You should work in the secretarial office, let's say, for the sake of doing that job well. And in doing that job well, and in doing it to the best of your ability, as it were, this spiritual perfection will develop. So, it is a very uh, helpful doctrine in terms of getting people through the deck. And it does teach you how to organize and discipline your mind. And I think in that regard, it's extremely positive. But on the other side, it's not going to teach you how to change the world in any way. It's going to tell you, be content with what you have. And um, if you're a garbage person, picking up garbage on the street, you should do that well. I think there's a lot to recommend that in terms of life. See, whatever the job a person has, it's really, it's really bad and, and not very pleasing or admirable to see them doing it badly. They're supposed to be picking up pieces of paper along the highway, and that's what their, their, their job is. And they shouldn't be sloughing off talking to each other and you know, laughing at their job. They should pick up all the pieces of paper. And what they're saying is if you do that job well, you will attain that evenness. Uh, which is the same as a kind of spiritual uh, enlightenment and well-being. That's the best I can do for you on Karma Yoga. See you next time. We'll finish this book, hopefully, next time. Then we'll talk about an exam after that.